Rainbow Six Siege, the world's most misunderstood FPS game. It's a game that represented a unique combination of difficult decisions surrounding the market viability of military and law enforcement themed shooters. It's perhaps the game that tried to do everything all at once. Despite a decidedly more gritty aesthetic in its marketing and release, the actual game simply did not play out this way. As the art style got a bit more creative, to say the least, the game slowed down. Now, compared to its competition in the FPS space, it is a decidedly more thought out, slower, and more deliberate game than anything else on the mainstream market. Yet, it's maligned for feeling the opposite way. So what's the deal with this game? Was it destined to fail? Or did it accomplish great feats, all things considered? Either way, anybody who talks about Rainbow Six Siege has strong feelings about it. Which is why in this video, we're going to take a look at the entirety of the development history of Rainbow Six Siege, but not just in the mechanics. We're going to talk about its most polarizing aspect. Why was Rainbow Six Siege made solely into a multiplayer competitive game, instead of a traditional $60 narrative experience with multiplayer on the side? The answer to that question is much more complicated than you think, and it starts with some old books and the topics they dealt with. It's a typically busy summer day at Dulles International Airport, which lies at a half hour drive from Washington, DC. A professor of international law who teaches at Georgetown is on his way to catch a plane going to LaGuardia in New York City, where he'll be providing counsel at the United Nations building. He likes books by John Grisham, Ken Follett, and Tom Clancy. He swings by the convenience store to grab some Tums for the heartburn he got from having just a little too much coffee that morning and notices a copy of Clancy's new book, Rainbow Six, on the shelf. Our hypothetical individual cracks open the fresh new book on the plane and doesn't ignore the irony of the story beginning with, of course, a plane hijacking. He would have no idea Rainbow Six would go from another stoic hardcover book to a game where a team must compete to defuse a bomb on a plane. He'd have no idea Rainbow Six would host a community of young people across a breadth of different backgrounds, not in a conceited way, he probably just assumed they'd never be into this kind of thing. Rainbow Six Siege is not a game like the Rainbow Six game that came out the same year in 1998. At least, not exactly. It's not like Rainbow Six Vegas either, which was meant to compete with more mainstream shooter games like Gears of War. And it wasn't like Rainbow Six Patriots, even though that comparison gets thrown around from time to time. Rainbow Six Patriots is an idea shrouded mostly in mystery, and most gamers haven't even heard about it. But it made the front cover of Game Informer's December 2011 issue. It claimed to be a groundbreaking and controversial look at homegrown terror. Lady Liberty is colored in bright yet desaturated ruby red, her eyes marked off like whiteout, her stola torn in ribbons as if it went through a paper shredder. Just a little over 10 years prior to this magazine's issue, New York was struck by terror. The wounds were old, but the scars were not. In Tom Clancy products, you never played as the bad guy. That was the rule. Even in situations of societal collapse like Tom Clancy's The Division, the bad guys crossed a line. But people don't think of themselves as the bad guys. You're the one who's in the wrong. I have the correct interpretation. I'm the true patriot. The antagonists of this new game called themselves the true patriots. Our main villain monologues about the corruption of Wall Street, 
They're willing to take corporate types, strap bombs to them, and toss them out in a gridlocked street from maximum collateral and detonate. And a rainbow specialist must fire on NYPD officers to prevent them from mistakenly detonating a dead man switch on the bridge. A civilian roped into the terror plot is thrown off that bridge to prevent more casualties moments before that bomb detonates. In the spring of 2012, Ubisoft would tell Game Informer that the creative director David Sears was no longer working on the Rainbow Six Patriots team. In 2013, Tom Clancy passed away in Baltimore, the city he was born and raised in. Ubisoft, the company that bought the rights from the man himself to work with his licenses for the purpose of game development, would then state they would keep his name on subsequent titles out of respect. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Patriots was canceled a year later, with Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege as its replacement. Many people assume that the multiplayer of Rainbow Six Patriots essentially turned into Rainbow Six Siege. Ubisoft's official stance on the transition from Patriots to Siege was that it was necessary to take advantage of new hardware, hopping over from one console generation to the next. Regardless of whether one believes that statement or not, the game went into the production pipeline with some new ideas that hadn't really been attempted before by an FPS game. For all of us here in Montreal, Rainbow Six is a hallowed franchise, the godfather of tactical shooters, and we are dedicated to respect this legacy. This was Ubisoft's official wording back in 2014. They used the phrase tactical shooter. When people think of a tactical shooter, they probably think of Ready or Not. Ready or Not is a game that tries to apply a realistic gameplay mechanics approach to dangerous police work. You could compare Ready or Not to Rainbow Six Raven Shield, but you'd have a harder time comparing it to Siege. So what exactly happened? Why did Ubisoft use the term tactical shooter? Well, it is a tactical shooter. The game promised a rich and multifaceted multiplayer experience with lots of moving parts. You could blow a lot of stuff up. You could also use certain stuff to keep said stuff from blowing up. The game emphasized information gathering and information denial. It was also asymmetric. Counter-Strike had attack and defense with a one life rule, but the maps had a certain discernible flow that remained static. In Siege, you could destroy walls and floors, and the game started with an intel phase every round. Attackers started from outside of a building and worked their way inside. Destruction mechanics were integrated into multiplayer games in the past, but this was different in the sense that nobody had tried to put map destruction elements into a competitive environment. And Ubisoft made it really clear that competition was an important aspect of the game design process. Marketing for the game led heavily with the concept of the operator system. Each operator had a unique set of equipment that could be tailored to individual tasks and roles. So even when the game only had 20 characters compared to the 70 that it has now, resource management was already an important component of the gameplay loop. This would become a critical aspect of the game's live service model and give the game the category Hero Shooter. Hero Shooter is a descriptor. It doesn't necessarily make a game bad quality on its own. Team Fortress 2 is a hero shooter and beloved. But with Siege releasing in December of 2015 with no particularly robust single player content to speak of for $60 at the time, and Overwatch releasing in the following spring of 2016 for $40, also with no particularly robust single player content to speak of, comparisons were made and a lot of people asked, what was the point? In 2016, Overwatch announced that over 20 million people had played the game. That meant internet cafes, which weren't insignificant for that metric, and the monthly player counts were not disclosed to the public, but it was still nothing to scoff at. Blizzard's Overwatch was directly competing with Valve's Team Fortress 2, a game that came out in 2007. It hovered in between the 47,000 to 52,000 average players figure over the course of March 2016 to 2017. The esports scene for Counter-Strike was starting to be hugely solidified too, marking the throne for the world's premier competitive FPS. The game sat comfortably above 320,000 average monthly players regularly, which made the tens of thousands it hit a couple years ago seem irrelevant. So how was Rainbow Six Siege doing?
it was hanging in there, and it had a console player base. The game wasn't dead, but there wasn't that pop-off moment the competition around it had at the time. You had Black Ops 3 with multiplayer and a single-player campaign for $60. Battlefield 4 had a boatload of downloadable multiplayer content. The Star Wars Battlefront reboot comes out, and a new Star Wars movie is released. Destiny was churning out new campaigns like they were nothing, and had been for years at this point. Rainbow Six Siege releases for $60 with no single player, aside from the terrorist hunt mode, which more or less boiled down to a glorified shooting range. 20 characters, three game modes, it would have 14 maps by the end of 2016. That was the content. But something stood out in this data. Despite all of this, there was a steady, noticeable climb in player count in the winter, peaking in February. Okay, well, more people are inside playing video games. It's too cold, right? Well, that's actually a great thread to follow. If more people are inside, more people are on the computer. If more people are on the computer, well... And Necrox still uncontested! EG! One map away! Gone. He is very wisely not getting the initial frag into triple kill! Will key now to one! With no other options in sight, the Siege team dove as far as they could into the multiplayer component and embraced the esports scene. The gamble seemed to pay off as player counts rose dramatically every year around February. A lot of articles came out around this time talking about the dramatic revival of Siege and how Ubisoft essentially turned a bad situation into something that was profitable and enjoyable to many. The game was starting to develop a unique culture unto itself. Familiar names, familiar faces, familiar voices. But there was one problem. The game was very complicated, and it had a steep learning curve. And over time, it was made very clear that the developers, the esports scene, and the average player all had different ideas of how the game should be played. Rainbow Six Siege would eventually become the esports tactical shooter. But to become this, some decisions were made that not everybody was happy with. You cannot block the castle. You cannot block the, sh uh, the shields. Bark is great for going below and working his way up. Sledge and Bok are two complete counteractions of each other, but they both serve the same title as vertical players. Why is it bad that he's a unique opportunist? Sledge, who can be used in similar situations, wrong, he can't, cannot breach ceilings or upper walls however. No. True, which is exactly why he can't be used in similar situations. In an esports tournament, what can be commonly overlooked as unimportant can be the difference between winning and losing. Since operators were a core part of the game, giving every single operator a unique identity is important to the experience. But when that uniqueness interferes with the competitive integrity of the game, it can make for clashing opinions between two player bases. Nothing represents the clash between the average player and the esports scene in Siege better than the operator, Zofia. Sophia was added in 2017 during Operation White Noise. It's important to note at this point the game was getting a new map every three months with these content updates. And Operation Health had bought the developers time to release operators in a delayed fashion. Sophia from the Polish Grom and Takebi and Vigil with the South Korean White Tigers. Sophia was added as an entry fragger, essentially a buffed up version of the vanilla operator Ash. They both focused on their gunplay while Ash had a breaching round that could destroy defender utility or walls, Sophia had the same destructive capacity as well as proximity-based stun grenades that could be used to check power positions and aggressively clear them. Her guns were powerful, and she had a bit more health than Ash, making her a great frontline character. Sophia also had a unique trait. She could pick herself up from down but not out with the withstand feature. Operators who got reduced to a considerably low health pool that wasn't enough to outright kill them were put in down but not out, where they could crawl on the ground to safety and be revived by a teammate. But Sophia was unique in the sense that she could revive herself without a teammate's help. On the surface, this made for an interesting gameplay dynamic, but in practice, it created frustrating scenarios where Sophia got to play a different set of rules compared to her teammates. The difference between fun and balancing was prevalent here, and the topic was hotly debated for some time. Four years later, balancing won, and in 2021, Zofia had her withstand ability removed, to a huge outcry from the player base. In a vacuum, this change probably wouldn't have amounted to much, 
But when it's contextualized with other decisions, it's clear about the backlash that took place in 2021 wasn't the result of that one decision alone. It was the result of several more. Another problematic operator was Jaeger. Jaeger had been in the game since release and was unique among his peers for having a scope-equipped assault rifle. It gave him a unique punch at range that other defenders simply didn't have. Attackers were equipped with assault rifles to mitigate the downside of fighting without the comfort of defending. But Jaeger could duke it out with some of the attack's best fraggers. His gadget was a deployable trophy system that could zap away grenades and launchable projectiles. He placed the ADSs somewhere and ran off to go spawn peeking. He was one of the most played operators in the game for his powerful gun, scope, and high speed rating. He was fun, but he was powerful too. His pick rate at one point was quite literally off the charts. The so-called win delta matrix that Ubisoft used to contextualize their balance decisions to the public. So one day, Jaeger lost his scope. Not good enough. At another point, the gun got a damage nerf. The gun had recoil added. It had more recoil added. The gun had five bullets removed from the mag. Jaeger was changed from a high speed rating to a medium speed rating. Jaeger was nerfed again and again and again, but his pick rate at the time still remained relatively high. So was he really just that broken? Well, everything else had been nerfed except one thing, his gadget. His trophy system was modified, and instead of zapping away two grenades and being done with it, the ADSs could only zap one grenade. They could recharge to punish the attack for not capitalizing on their plan fast enough, but one ADS, in that instance, did half the work. His pick rate finally went down, but he was no longer nearly as fun to play. The 416 kicked like a mule disproportionately to the amount of damage it put out, and other defenders had better weapon options with scopes and an easier time hitting headshots. The game revolved around low recoil and high rate of fire, thanks to his one-shot headshot mechanic. So the devs got what they wanted. Jaeger was no longer a problem pick, because nobody wanted to play him. When changes like this took place, the first community that got blamed wasn't Ubisoft. Sure, they got blamed for it, but Ubisoft was acting on behalf of a secret, inside, more malicious force pulling the strings the esports community. Even though most people in the esports community, patch after patch, regularly disagreed with Ubisoft, pointing out that the reason Jaeger was picked so much wasn't just because of the fragging power. He was just a really important operator for his ability to deny frag grenades. The game revolved around the back and forth of the gadgetry and resource management game. So of course Jaeger was going to be picked consistently even on a slower, more support-oriented role like a heavily armored anchor. But the blame was placed at the feet of the esports scene anyway. Ubisoft was catering to these people and making the game less fun as a result. Varen ruining it. Esports was blamed consistently for a number of unpopular decisions and continues to be. Despite pushback against Ubisoft's balancing, almost always coming from the esports scene first. Greatly influential players in the scene would butt heads with Ubisoft's approach consistently. One thing that the game was critically maligned for was the pivot to the esports scene at all, despite the advertising of a more military-themed tactical shooter. But the game also had its movement speed and gun handling characteristics considerably slowed down over time. So why do people insist the game was becoming more unrealistic? Was it because the game was becoming more unrealistic mechanically? Or thematically? Diversity is a hot topic in the gaming space. When Battlefield 5 was revealed in 2018, people were fast to point out considerable creative liberties had been taken. The game went back to World War II. Battlefield 1, which had come out previously, is still regularly praised for its presentation, art direction, and thematic aspects. While the game wasn't even in the slightest bit realistic, the cool factor of the setting was leaned into considerably, providing what was essentially a theatrical version of World War I. Battlefield 5 was clearly theatrical too, but it wasn't authentic with its art style. The game's depiction of a British woman who was supposedly serving on the front lines received a considerable amount of criticism. Comparatively, 
Rainbow Six Siege was a multiplayer game without a narrative component. But that didn't stop its competition from delving into inclusivity themes. Overwatch was the same way, featuring a globetrotting cast, which was diverse by its nature. And then about nine months after Overwatch dropped in 2016, hey, Tracer's gay. All right, that's cool. Then three years later, hey, Soldier 76 is gay. Okay. Four years after that, Cole and I have known each other for a long time. He's like a brother to me. And besides, I'm a lesbian. Which a lot of Overwatch players suspected already, since it seemed like Farah and Mercy had a thing for each other. Well, gee, that's lots of lesbians. But Overwatch was decidedly a fictional work taking place in a universe where people can fly through the sky in a Gundam suit. Rainbow Six was supposed to be about real counter-terrorist units. So there wasn't a place for these kinds of conversations. Right? In September of 2021, the Croatian operator Osa was added as the PMC Night Haven's R&D lead. A trans woman. In June of 2022, the Belgian operator Sens was added to Team Rainbow, adding the game's first non-binary operator. And as recent as the winter of 2024, Tuberau from Portugal's DAE CTU was added. A trans man. But for most people, the only way you would have known is if you clicked from here to here and read the character bio. It's a multiplayer game, so who reads the character bio? Not a lot of people, but Ubisoft still writes them. Just like they wrote Harry's globetrotting adventures looking for new rainbow candidates. Siege has a pretty surprisingly large amount of character background for a game that's exclusively multiplayer. Every operator in the game has a pretty extensive backstory. When the game first dropped, there was a bigger emphasis on the dossier military recruitment sort of approach, citing their relevant experiences. Thunderbird adds to the diverse ethnic makeup of Rainbow, being a woman from the Nakoda tribe of Canada, but she's also an aerial medic. A guy from Norway, Ace, ties in the EMT community even more, with experience as a paramedic. Vigil is implied to have fled North Korea as a child. One of the organization's most active field agents, Ash, a prominent fire team lead, is Israeli born to an implied Israeli mother and a Palestinian father. Alibi from Libya is with the Italian Special Forces, and she cracks down on a human trafficking ring. That's a pretty gritty and involved storyline. It's not exactly Queer Eye. The game features a whole team of Russian operators at a hugely controversial time to do so. It treks across the entire globe to find its members, from South Africa to Morocco, Belarus, Ireland, Peru, India, Jordan, Thailand, and that's just to name a few. There's not a single continent the game hasn't featured. So compared to what else is available as far as live service games are concerned, it's the most military and tactically looking of everything available, and the most diverse. It doesn't stop people from having something to say, though. In 2021, a former professional player made transphobic comments at the caster Emmy Donaldson who was working the Siege Invitational that year, and basically kissed any prospects at further play in the scene goodbye, when the director of the esports program at the time, one Wei Yue, said Rainbow Six and Rainbow Six Esports have no place for sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or any kind of bigotry. And it was a hugely popular sentiment. So it's clear that the diversity angle is not hurting the game. And leaning into the esports component seems to have helped the game retain a player base moving into 2017 and beyond. So what's the problem now? As a multiplayer game, Rainbow Six Siege then never really focused on a narrative element, which was uncharacteristic of a Tom Clancy license. Even your open world multiplayer co-op experiences like Ghost Recon Wildlands still had a narrative element. Tom Clancy was an author after all. Now Siege's narrative was extremely limited. There was a nameless, faceless organization called the White Masks with unclear motivations and unclear affiliations. They were essentially target practice. One particularly unique mob was a bomber that would run towards you with an explosive vest, and you had to hit them multiple times in the head. These bad guys still had a limited narrative role in a cutscene narrated by the program lead, so-called Six, played by Angela Bassett. This character was important but it was clear that the operators were the stars of the show. When the game first dropped, each operator had a unique cutscene that would play when you unlocked them. 
these cutscenes gave you a fantastical idea of what this operator could do, but it also gave the voice actors an opportunity to have some fun and give the character a little bit of personality. The DLC characters that got added afterwards didn't have these cutscenes. When the year two content plan kicked in, the menus that used to have dedicated photo shoots as their backgrounds were swapped out with CGI props. Dedicated CGI trailers for the characters of Siege wouldn't start getting added again until 2019. In 2019, a new six, a new program director was appointed in the Rainbow Six lore. He went by Harry. Harry envisioned a publicly viewable tournament called the Siege Invitational, the same name used for that very same Siege Invitational that takes place every February, a publicly viewable esports event. It's clear that there was an attempt made to bridge the gap between the narrative focus of a Tom Clancy license with the decidedly multiplayer focus of Rainbow Six as a practical product. Harry doesn't look like a former Navy SEAL, but he's certainly not portrayed as an idiot when it comes to military policy, diplomacy, and the steps required to find good, suitable candidates for an international crime fighting team like Rainbow. Harry's assessment of new candidates is commonly depicted in concept art, with scenes that seem to take direct inspiration from old-school political and spy thrillers. A lot of the art looks like it was ripped right out of a Lee Child book. Despite this, the game doesn't make money here. It makes money off of its esports scene and cosmetics. But esports is a very contentious topic right now in the gaming space. It's commonly associated with corporate greed, microtransactions, and a lack of artful identity. In 2023, a new narrative for Rainbow Six Siege started. Harry is shot and killed by a former Rainbow operative who claims he turned his former unit into the Ice Capades, as opposed to a feared organization of apex killers. He calls himself Deimos, the Greek god of panic and fear. Subsequent map content added to the game ties into this overarching narrative. The office at his secret base contains a copy of Voltaire and a book on Russian history. His lair is adorned with paintings displaying military valor. As of now, his specific political motives remain unclear, but the usage of the word disgrace might indicate he's a proponent of a sort of extreme view on real politic, as opposed to Harry's idealism. Where will this narrative go? Is it all just for marketing, more fluff to give a semblance of artful environment to a product that's purely sold off of its competitive identity, its sporting identity? Probably. But I don't think it will matter if there's no sport to be played. And there's a faction of people who really do want to see Rainbow Six Siege fail. I won't tell you the game is being maliciously attacked. But the recent wave of cheaters certainly has the effect a coordinated campaign could have. A common complaint that you'll find at the highest competitive levels of the game is cheating. It's not a new phenomenon, but the severity of it seems to depend on who you talk to. Unfortunately, if the primary product you're advertising is the multiplayer component, a miserable ranked matchmaking experience is its kryptonite. In February of 2022, Ubisoft announced they had banned over 166,000 accounts for cheating in competitive multiplayer within a year and a half at the time. That seems like a lot, but Counter-Strike had banned over 600,000 accounts at one point in a month. PUBG has banned millions of accounts over several years. Naturally, Ubisoft can only release so much to the public or cheaters could find ways to reverse engineer their systems. The pattern remains the same over the years. A massive cheating wave strikes the game, all hope seems lost, and Ubisoft issues a massive ban wave. The coast seems clear, then another wave of cheaters, followed by another wave again, and again, and again. Cheating is impacting the entire industry, but it seems to be a common talking point with Siege in particular because of the game's complex nature. Good cheaters can hide their cheats well, albeit most of them don't. But the fact that the game relies so much on information and anticipation makes it difficult to ascertain whether somebody is cheating or not. Ubisoft encourages their players to report players, 
if something is suspicious. But at what point is somebody just good at the game versus them having information that they shouldn't have? The area is so gray that the incentive to learn the game seems extremely limited. What is the point in learning one of the most complex FPS games on the planet if you're actively going to have your experience punished for improving and getting better? The answer is, you'll probably play something else. A commonly cited claim is that the engine Rainbow Six Siege uses, the Anvil engine, is too out of date to be running a modern live service FPS game like Siege. Siege is well known to be a bit buggy with new content releases, and the release of the content update is usually met with server problems and delays. Siege is no exception to the Murphy's Law of live service gaming. If it can be delayed, it'll be delayed. Code will get broken. So what's a solution? What's a way to get everybody talking about the engineering to shut up? Well, a game we've been comparing Siege to often in this video, Overwatch, led eventually to Overwatch 2. The business overhead concerning the release of the sequel became so dramatic and controversial that a pressure cooker built at the company until Activision Blizzard's embroilment with its workplace drama finally became untenable and the company was bought out by Microsoft. With the gutting of the Overwatch League finally happening afterwards, Face It is supposed to continue Overwatch competitive with the Overwatch Champions League soon, though some needed specifics aren't available to the public quite yet. A sequel, a reboot, whatever you want to call it, is not always the solution. Rainbow Six Siege has gone through multiple tournament organizers for its esports matches. From ESL, to Face It, and finally to Blast, who has received considerable flack for reducing the overall amount of matches in a given year, as well as the teams that play in the majors. Some people think the format stinks, some people think it's fine. The reality is, the people who pay attention to Siege Esports are outnumbered by the people who don't. It all begs the question then, if it was worth it. Back up the day. How did that even- So, I'm not a physics major, but I know that a grenade this big is not getting through a hole this big. What the f So we're in copper. You're gonna throw another one. You're gonna throw another one? Albert Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I never snitch on you, dairy. I hold a brick for you, dearie. It's fair to say that Siege is the sum of its parts. Without a committed player base, without the support it got releasing out of the gate in 2015, without the fans, without devs who cared, the game would not have lasted very long. But Ubisoft Montreal is a big company managing a lot of different things at the same time. Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, Prince of Persia, Watch Dogs, For Honor, and more. The conceptualization of this game that goes back to Rainbow Six Patriots is there, maybe in part. Maybe Deimos is a pull from that lore book, for all we know. But the people, the individuals responsible for the concept of Patriots and eventually Siege, have moved on to different projects. Amazon has opened a studio in Montreal and hired the former game director of Rainbow Six Siege, John Baptiste L.A. For a time, he conceptualized operators, arguably during the point at which public sentiment for the game was the highest in 2016 to 2019. He is supposedly working on a secret project as a director, and has been for a couple of years. Xavier Marquis, the creative director at Siege for seven years, a guy who had been with the game since its inception, left in 2020 to work at Amazon too, as a creative director. Unless they haven't updated their LinkedIn's in a while, they're still working there. I don't know what will happen to Siege. I don't know if Amazon will unveil a blow-it-all-away sized, destruction-based, tactical shooter that will compete with Siege. I don't know if Siege will die tomorrow. It's remained alive due to passionate fans, and it's beautiful take on what shooter games are capable of. A perfect mix of tactical and strategic skill. This video isn't a call to action, just a story to contextualize the difficult questions the game had to face, particularly its timing in the market in an ever-changing and evolving gaming landscape. But with the success of single-player games happening so much recently, it does beg the question, how popular would a single-player reboot of the license be? I don't know, because they tried and it tanked. My only advice, instead of a game about aliens, make a game that champions the diplomatic initiative of Rainbow and see where it leads you.